to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. 
Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Here ends the reading.
Beloved, welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley and happy Easter. Thank you for reciprocating. Uh, appreciate that. Every single person who walks, crawls, limps, rolls uh, across this threshold with their heart half open changes who we are, who we can be together, opens us to new possibilities, reveals to us new ways in which God is at work in the world. Every exhalation you bring into this space is a stirring of the spirit and every breath you take in is a witness to resurrection life. Whether you've been here a thousand times before or this is your first time and you are still on the fence, we welcome you. Not as owners or those in charge, but as those who are welcomed by others who came before us and by Christ who came before them. So welcome, we hope you stay long enough to tell your story and share some life with us. And if you have never been here before, we hope you uh, will fill out a connect card, which you can find in the pew in front of you and bring to the welcome tent following worship. Give us the gift of letting us know you. Beloved, it was into the moment of deepest fear and greatest uncertainty that Jesus spoke his peace to the disciples. A shalom big enough for all that meant food for the hungry, healing for the hurting, and liberation for the oppressed. It was a peace so real that it changed everything. And it is that same peace that was passed down to us and which we now pass to each other. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please turn and share the peace of Christ with those around you and then scoot in to make room for those who, who come late. Good morning, First Press, and Happy Easter! Happy morning. Easter! Happy what a wonderful morning, and it's about to get even better because the family of Christ is growing hmm. by two. <laughs> Children, come on up into what we like to call the splash zone to help me welcome Cairo and Emmett to the family of God. Come on up, help us to celebrate. This is a big day. Come on up. Indeed, the God we worship is a God who makes and keeps promises, not only to the world in general, but to love persons in particular, to love Cairo and Emmett in particular. Through baptism, we enter the covenant that God has established. Through baptism in water, we are reminded of the waters of creation, of when God led God's people through the waters to freedom, and of Jesus' baptism in the waters of the River Jordan. Within this covenant of baptism, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing this covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Today, Cairo and Emmett are giving expression to their own faith and claiming through baptism the glorious promises of God. 
For the rest of us, let us remember and rejoice in our own baptisms or look forward to that day when we will claim God's promises as our own as we celebrate this blessed sacrament today. Cairo and Emmett, today you are choosing to claim the glorious promises of God for yourselves through baptism. As you do, you have the opportunity to affirm your own promises, and we as a congregation will affirm some promises to you. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then Clerk James and Teacher Rosemary will ask some questions of the congregation. Does that sound okay? All right. So Cairo, Emmett, do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Do you? Relying on God's grace, will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? I will. Awesome. Do you, members of the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley and all believers wishing, worshiping with us, promise on behalf of the Church Universal to undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of Cairo and Emmett, that as they continue to grow, they will know that they belong to God and are meant to serve God's purpose in the world. Do you? We do. Do you, children of First Press, welcome Cairo and Emmett into your church? Do you promise to be a friend to them, share with them, Join in their laughter, dry their tears when they cry, help them up if they fall down. They're pretty big for that. And teaching them what you know about God, do you? Awesome. <laughs> Blessed community, let us pray together. Gracious God, send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it and raise them to new life and graft them to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them that they may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. Amen. 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 Cairo, do you want to come first? All right, so I'm going to have you turn and face the community. So what name shall we baptize you today? Cairo Inamoto. Cairo Inamoto. Cairo Inamoto, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> this is also the splash zone. <laughs> All right. And by what name shall we baptize you today? Emmett Yoshio. Emmett Yoshio Inamoto. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, God of our fathers and our mothers and our children, you call each of us by name and promise us your constant love and everlasting grace. We pray for the presence of your spirit with Cairo and Emmett. Watch over them. Guide them as they grow in faith. Soften them to care about their family and neighbors and about the welfare of even those they do not know. Accept these new citizens of your kingdom, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Cairo and Emmett have been sealed into the promises of God and marked as Christ's own forever. Through baptism, God has made them members of Christ's body, the church. They are members of God's family, and therefore they are members of ours. They are now received into Christ's church and this church. So let us welcome these newest members of our church family.
I invite you to stand and join in celebrating this moment through our sung response. You may be seated.
think you all covered it. <laughs> hey, I, I just have to say to our choir and our musicians, to our worship band, to James, for guiding us musically through this entire Lenten journey. Thank you. <laughs> Beloved, let us pray. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Silence within us any voices but your own. Open our hearts and our minds to the good news you have for us this and every day. This we pray in the name of our rock and our redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, again, welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley on this Easter Sunday. A very, very special welcome to our youngest theologians in our midst. I see you. I'm so glad that you came back. Where's your mom? So my friend last week, his mom was having a hard time finding the right time. So he marched up to me at the end of service and he said, my mom is having a tantrum. And so we made sure that she got the right time. And I am so glad that you are here. I'm glad to see your face. Oh, you are oh, hiding Easter. Okay, got it, got it. Very important stuff. Well, I'm glad that you are here. Now, here is the good news, though. The hard part is over. You made it to church on Easter Sunday. You fought traffic and your alarm clock and maybe even certain family members, but you are here, which is no small feat. After all, we live in a world that is either fixed down below on all that scrolls on our screens or way out there to what lies ahead, but you have set aside this sacred time to worship God. Now, since you are already here, I want to invite you to do three things this morning. The first is to just be present. Settle in, get comfortable, take a deep breath, and be where you actually are. The second is to look around. Notice things you haven't noticed before, like the magnificent organ pipes, or the child dancing next to you, or wiggling, or running away from you in the pew, or the face of someone you haven't seen in a while, or maybe even ever. And last but not least, I want you to pay attention to the good and the bad, the holy and the hard, the extraordinary, but most importantly, pay attention to the weird. Yes, you heard me right, I said it. All of this, in case you haven't realized, is very, very weird. I mean, a room full of people of every age and background, race and culture, sexual and gender identity, people who hail from different places, speak different languages, claim different politics and beliefs, yet have chosen to come together on this day, in this place, for this sacred hour, to lift up our collective voices as we sing the same songs and pray to the same God. Now that, my friends, is weird. But weird is good. Weird is holy. Weird is what reminds us that things are not always as they appear to be or as they should be. Which means that all of us are here on this Easter Sunday because we worship the God of weird. And that weirdness reaches its peak level because today is Resurrection Sunday. The final stop in our Holy Week journey. Our reading for today comes from the Gospel according to John and takes place three days after Jesus was crucified on a cross and died. We pick up the story in chapter 20, verse 10, right after Mary Magdalene and the disciples have just discovered that the stone at the entrance of Jesus' tomb has been moved away so weird. So listen up, folks, for God has spoken and continues to speak to us this day. Then, 
the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Now, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Beloved, this is indeed the word of the Lord. For the past seven months, we here at First Press have been in the business of asking questions. From basic ones like, what is your name? To scary ones like, what if I lose my faith? This Lent, we took it a step further and looked at the question Jesus asks of us in Scripture. But question asking is not limited to the church, of course. Humans have always been a curious and inquisitive species. Case in point, did you know that Google processes 8.5 billion searches a day? The average adult asks around 73 questions a day, while the average child asks somewhere between 200 and 4 trillion questions. But more importantly, our constant question asking embodies the fact that we as humans are always in search of something, whether it's asking a stranger where they are from or asking God what's the meaning of life. And yet, if we are being really honest with ourselves, it's not the question that we're interested in as much as the answer. As soon as we realize that we don't know something, our instinct is to immediately fix that, to find an answer or a solution or a resolution to the unknown. But not so much for Jesus. No, Jesus was all about the questions. Case in point, did you know that across all four Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions? And of the 183 questions asked of him, he answered three. Why? Well, because while answers provide closure, questions blow things wide open. While answers speak to the issue at hand, questions reveal what is hidden beneath. And on a rare occasion, sometimes even the best questions can answer themselves. We see this in our text for today. As the story, according to John, goes, at the earliest possible hour, when it was still dark outside, one of Jesus' dearest friends and followers, Mary Magdalene, returns to his tomb to tend to his body, only to discover that the stone that is supposed to be guarding the entrance has been removed. Things are not as they should be. Something is off. Something is weird. And so assuming the worst, Mary runs and tells the other disciples, two of whom return with her and confirm that Jesus' body is no longer there, but his bandages are folded neatly in piles. Now clearly this is not the work of some midnight grave robber, so the disciples conclude that they have seen enough, which means that they can go home. But not Mary. No, Mary is not satisfied. Mary's got some questions. Mary remains. 
And so while the disciples return to the safety of their rooms with locked doors, Mary posts up at the entrance of Jesus' tomb. While the disciples run and hide, Mary stays and weeps. And even then, in the midst of her fear and her sorrow, Mary goes into the tomb looking for Jesus, only to discover two angels, one gardener, and three questions. Now, as the story goes, two of the three questions are the exact same. Woman, why are you weeping? Which means not once, but twice, Mary's grief is given space to breathe. Twice, Mary is able to say the things that are not as they should be. Twice, Mary is invited to just be, which was an impossible ask given the circumstances. After all, how could Mary be present when Jesus was missing? But instead of getting the answer she was looking for in that tomb, Mary gets yet another question. Mary, for whom are you looking? Now, the irony of this question is not lost on us, the wildly intelligent reader. It's like watching an episode of Superman and yelling at the people on TV who somehow don't see that Clark Kent is just Superman with glasses on. In the same way, we know what's going on the entire time. But poor Mary, poor Mary has no idea that is until he says her name in the way that only Jesus could, somehow containing the fullness of who she was, but also who she could be, all in one breath, Mary. And so as the story goes, in that moment, Mary finally sees who has been standing in front of her this entire time, the one for whom she weeps, the one she has been looking for, her rabbi, her teacher, her savior, her friend. In that very moment, Mary becomes the first person in all of Scripture to witness the very thing we have come to celebrate today, the resurrected Christ. So exactly one week ago, I challenged many of you not to come to church just on Easter, but to join us for the entire Holy Week journey. Now, the reason I did that is because most normal people like to skip over the gruesome parts of the story and get to the happy part, the very end. But I'm not most normal people. I'm weird. Easter is actually the least favorite part of Holy Week for me. Now, give me the huddled masses on Palm Sunday, or the cryptic dinner on Maundy Thursday, or even the painful tragedy on Good Friday, because those parts I get. Those parts actually make sense with everything else that I see in the world today. But a God who dies, then comes back from the dead only to leave again? Come on, what kind of happy ending is that? It makes no sense. And it's actually not the whole coming back from the dead part that's an issue for me. Surprisingly, I do believe in the bodily resurrection. I do. I don't think it's a metaphor or an illusion or a grief-induced dreamscape. I believe what the Bible says is true. And not just because the Bible says it's true, but because never once did Jesus not mean what he said. Never once did he take the easy way out. Never once did his love for humanity not go the entire distance and then some. Do I think that death was going to be the exception? Not a chance. Now, the part of this story that doesn't make sense to me is how we are supposed to celebrate the fact that, that because of the resurrection, everything has changed, even though it seems like nothing has changed. I mean, look around. Empires continue to criminalize and execute the innocent. Entire peoples are still crying out for a Messiah, even in the very place our Messiah was born. Yes, sin and death have been defeated, but that doesn't change the fact that the hungry are still hungry, the poor are still poor, and what's worse, the dead are still dead. 
You want to know why I'm weeping? I'm weeping because even though everything has changed, it seems like nothing has changed. You want to know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for an answer, a solution, a resolution to this never-ending question that we call life. And so for the past few weeks, I've spent hours and hours in the Bible looking for the answer, honestly, any answer, until I finally remembered that Jesus wasn't about the answers, was he? No, Jesus was about the questions. And so again, after weeks of looking, after hours of studying, I finally remember that Jesus doesn't ask Mary, what are you looking for? He asks her, who? Mary, who are you looking for? Sometimes the best questions can even answer themselves. As it turns out, the weirdest and the most beautiful part of this story is that the one that we have been looking for has been standing in front of us the entire time time. As it turns out, the resurrection isn't a what, it's a who. It isn't some logical answer, it's a flesh and blood person. It isn't some magical solution, it is a relentless relationship. And it isn't some perfect resolution to all of life's problems, but it is the assurance that God is with us in the midst of it all. I mean, in that regard, you can't blame Mary for not seeing that the gardener was Jesus. After all, she came to that tomb looking for a dead body, and when he wasn't there, he came looking for an answer. The possibility of encountering the risen Christ himself did not even cross her mind, and yet that is exactly what happened. Because even in her grief, Mary went to the tomb. Even in her fear, she stayed even when she couldn't see past her wall of tears, Mary still looked for Jesus. And as a result, she found him. She found the one that she was looking for. In the end, it was Mary Magdalene who preached the first Easter proclamation on record with just five simple words. I have seen the Lord. And friends, that right there is how the resurrection changed everything, even when it seems like nothing has changed. The resurrection gives us the ability to see, to see what beauty and wonder exists even in our present circumstances and what promise and hope lies beyond to see that this is actually not the happy end of the story or even the best part. No, friends, this is just the beginning. The resurrection changed everything and continues to change everything because it gives us the ability to see that the one that we have been looking for has been standing in front of us the entire time. So perhaps the real question for us today is this, have you seen him? Have you seen the risen Lord? Now, if you haven't, don't, don't worry. Jesus can be quite sneaky like that. He always shows up in the places that you least expect him, with the people that you least expect him. But if you are looking and you do want to see Jesus, well, I do have some advice for you today. And it's this. First, be present settle in. Take a deep breath and be where you actually are. Second, look around. Notice things you haven't noticed before, like the subtle signs of life bursting in the midst of death, undeniable kindness and courage in the face of cowardice and war. Maybe even salvation in the face of the person sitting next to you. And friends, last but not least, pay attention to the good and the bad, the holy and the hard, the extraordinary, but most importantly, most definitely pay attention to the weird the holy reminder that things are not always as they appear to be or as they should be. Because the good news of the gospel, the good news of Easter is this. 
the one that you are looking for, the one that we are all looking for, will always be found. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer this morning? God of the bright and morning star, God of the rising sun, God of darkness banished, we praise and we worship you. For empty tombs, thank you. For disciples running with good news, thank you. 
for your presence, alive, powerful, resurrected. Thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us. Help us to grasp resurrection, to understand its hidden and subversive power, to see its force at work in our world in those who suffer, overturning evil empires, changing the hatred within us, moving the world slowly, yet forcefully, bending us towards love and truth, justice and mercy. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your witnesses, living resurrection and proclaiming good news. Good news in our kitchens and in our living rooms. Good news in the offices, workshops, and schoolrooms. Good news in the fields and in the factories. Good news in the streets. And may we be that good news in sacred actions, using words if and when necessary walking softly and gratefully on this good earth, caring gently for all people without distinction, living hopefully into your kingdom in a time of hopelessness and despair. Today, we think of all who are grieving. Lord, remember them. Today, we think of those sick and dying. Lord, remember them. And for places in this world that are torn by war and bloodshed, Lord, remember and save. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, may we catch a sight of your kingdom come in the resurrection of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Using the language most comfortable to you, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the light of the resurrection, we are invited to give according to the measure of the grace that God has given to us. Let us give joyfully as those who know that all that we have and all that we are are always gifts of God. There are several easy ways to give, which you can see on the screens. This morning, there is a fifth way to give, and that is to put your offering in the offering plates as they are passed. Dear beloved of God, let us give with glad and with generous hearts. Whoa. 
First Press, family and friends, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you did not leave us weeping at the tomb, that you are the answer to our question, who are you looking for? We give thanks for your love and for your sacrifice. Worthy are you, the lamb who was slain. We rejoice in your glorious and triumphant victory over death, and we thank you for the immeasurable gift of salvation. We thank you for the promises you have made and kept and continue to keep. May our hearts overflow with gratitude and praise. We lift our prayers to you, and as we breathe in this morning, we know that like the earth, you sustain us and keep us and work within us always. All gifts have their origin with you, Lord, and from your rich gifts we freely give, except we pray these offerings, but also our lives freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us, that your love will be shown here and throughout the world. And so, Lord, we lift our voices to you. We celebrate this most glorious day, the day of the light of resurrection. Thank you for all you have done for us. We offer our lives in gratitude for amazing grace and for blessings of this and all our days. We thank you, gracious God. May we ever live in praise to you. Amen. Amen. And now, please join us in singing the Hallelujah Chorus.
all just successfully auditioned for the choir. So yes, join James and the choir on Thursday evenings. Friends, the invitation is this. Be present, look around, and pay attention. For Christ has died, but Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. So go from this place resting in that holy truth. Love concretely, even when it is risky. Serve generously whoever has need. And pursue God's restoring justice until it rolls down like water. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.